Stocks suffered a mild sell-off here today as the buzz was all about Speaker Pelosi landing in Taiwan and what that might mean for relations between China and the United States. Beyond that, we of course have lots of companies still reporting their earnings and affecting the trading action. Today's big story from a macro perspective, I would say, was probably the surging 10-year Treasury yield after weeks of declining yields. Today we saw a big reversal of that. That may have an impact moving forward on some of those key technology stocks. Speaking of which, in tonight's trade application example, I'm going to do a bear call spread on one of the biggest technology-oriented companies here in the United States. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's August 2nd, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below and make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list, which you'll find in the description area. Once you're signed up for that, you'll receive emails whenever we post these videos. Now keep in mind, David is on vacation this week, uh, and so you won't hear from him uh, tomorrow. Uh, and so I'll be doing it, of course, tonight and then Thursday as well, and then he'll be back on Friday. Uh, but I know sometimes it's hard to keep up with our personal vacation schedules and things like that. So that's why it's nice to be on the email distribution list so that way uh, you're alerted whenever we do post these free videos here for you on YouTube. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's jump into today's trade activity and let's get started here with our S&P 500 heat map. And as you can see, we had a lot of red on the board here today. Um, so uh, it was a, a day where the, the bears finally gained a little bit of traction. Uh, you know, it's been kind of uh, steamrolled to the upside since the beginning of, of July. So you got to figure at some point uh, the bears will come fighting back. Uh, and today perhaps is where they dug in their heels a little bit more. Um, some of this might have been around the uh, Nancy Pelosi news of landing in Taiwan and what that might mean as far as you know, relations between China and uh, the United States and how that might affect our various economies and the, and the companies that do business uh, and co kind of commingle with one another within these two uh, huge countries. And uh, today you saw that there was a little bit of stress in the system, uh, perhaps around that. We'll also talk about a little bit later uh, that a lot of this stress may have been uh, caused by rising interest rates here today. But uh, as we kind of pick out some of the, the bigger movers from a larger cap perspective today, you can see most of the mega caps did struggle to a degree today. We had Microsoft down, uh, you know, we had Apple down, we had Amazon down. We'll actually talk about that one a little bit later on in tonight's video. Um, we had Visa down, uh, JP Morgan was down, which uh, we're thankful for. Remember, we still have that bear call spread going on JP Morgan in this uh, market outlook uh, related account uh, right now. So uh, that one's been working out nicely for us on the bearish side of the equation. Uh, Bank of America was down, uh, Berkshire Hathaway was down, uh, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Nike, uh, McDonald's, even Exxon and Chevron were down. Uh, and so most of the big players uh, did seem to find their way into the red. None of them uh, tremendously lower. I guess that's the good news. I guess the probably the biggest, most important uh, aggressive mover to the downside today was probably Caterpillar. Uh, it was down 5.8%, of course, being a, an important bellwether of the uh, industrial economy. On the, on the flip side of the equation, we did have some nice winners to the upside, including Alphabet. Uh, we had Tesla closing in the green. A lot of those alternative energy related stocks have done quite well here recently with some of the, the bill uh, being passed through uh, Washington DC like we mentioned when I was with you the last time in the video on Thursday. That, that theme has seen, continued to, to pick up steam with a lot of solar energy and other alternative related, uh, alternative energy related names doing quite well over the past week or so. We also saw AMD uh, come out with uh, earnings here this afternoon. We'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. Before that, in the normal session, it was up 2.59%. There's Enphase Energy, one of those solar companies I had mentioned before. In fact, I think I brought that one up with you guys on Thursday as well as this one directly below it, Solar Edge. Both of those were up once again here today. Um, we saw Intuitive Surgical, so uh, robotic surgery, uh, doing pretty well. Uh, that stock was trading below $200 after they announced their earnings here just uh, a week or two ago. And 
has already go gone all the way back up to 238. So uh, maybe some interested uh, buyers there when, when the merchandise went on sale. Uh, we saw PayPal uh, up about 1.2% today. That's another one we'll talk about here in just a moment because they did report earnings after the bell tonight as well. Uh, we saw Gartner uh, doing quite well, up about 7% today. Some of these are smaller names, uh, but uh, nonetheless, at least there's a smattering of green uh, names there on the board here in front of us. Let's go ahead and take a peek here at the normal part of the platform now. And you can see that from a breadth perspective within the S&P 500, we had about 120 names that closed the normal session today in the green. Uh, we did close near the lows of the session, so I have a feeling that had you checked this about midday, uh, the breadth measures would have looked quite a bit better, but uh, we had that sell off into the close and picked up a few more of those that were just barely hanging on to gains that did flush into uh, losses there towards the end. So pretty uh, obvious day uh, of, of, of wins there for the bears today with only 24% of stocks within the market closing in the green. Let's take a look at some of the after hours movers now uh, because today was yet another important day for earnings and that could very well impact our trading heading into tomorrow morning. So let's go ahead and get started here with PayPal. That's one of the big movers that we're seeing after hours right now. Uh, you can see the normal session close was about $89. And as it stands right now, we are trading at just a shade under $100 per share. In fact, it got all the way up to 102 at one point in the after hours session. It's kind of settled back down and is trading right around $100 per share as we speak. So uh, it appears to be on track for uh, tacking on an additional $10 per share as soon as tomorrow if these gains hold. Uh, they did report uh, earnings that uh, apparently Wall Street found enthusiastic. There's also uh, the confirmation of Elliott Management getting involved there. Remember that rumor had come out a couple of days back uh, and they are an activist um, hedge fund type of a manager out there and usually uh, kind of do a little bit more uh, shaking up uh, and uh, there's some rumors perhaps that uh, PayPal might uh, go forward and try to buy out Pinterest again. Some of you might have seen that Pinterest, if we, pin, if, if we bring that up here today, it was up nicely on its own right today, up about 11%, but um, there there were those rumors going around, I don't, I, I don't remember how long ago it was, it was maybe a half a year ago or so, that, uh, that PayPal might be interested in buying Pinterest, and uh, sounds like Elliott Management is now a, a fairly large shareholder in both companies, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the natural thought is uh, that deal could very well be on the table once again if, if they have their way. So we'll see. Um, other stocks reporting earnings tonight. Uh, Airbnb came out tonight. That did not uh, offer up as much enthusiasm from Wall Street. As you can see, Airbnb closed today's normal session at 116. They're currently trading at 105 in the after hours session, so giving up about $11 per share there. Uh, AMD, uh, of course, another big uh, semiconductor related play there. Uh, people anticipating that earnings announcement to see how they compare to Intel, which suffered dramatically last week after their earnings announcement. AMD uh, fared probably a little bit better, but still uh, trading lower in the after hour session here today by about $4 per share after announcing their earnings. Starbucks also reported earnings this evening. Starbucks is a company that we've had in our dividend growth investing portfolios a couple times along the way over the years here at Market Scholars. Looks like they're up a couple of bucks per share after hours. It's not a huge move, but uh, at least kind of uh, kind of climbing back from some more difficult uh, conditions they found themselves in earlier this year. They, they ended the day at 83.71 in the after hour session. They're trading just above 85 right now, but that's quite a bit above their 52 week low of 68 bucks. So uh, we've seen a number of these types of companies uh, come swinging back uh, in, in, in kind of uh, you know, getting back into more of a normalized trading range again after having a pretty difficult start to 2022. Other stocks that were trading after hours, uh, let's pull up Caesars. While well, it's probably not the most important company out there, uh, maybe tells us a little bit about uh, the willingness of uh, discretionary spending and travel. Uh, Caesars, as it stands right now, is trading down by about a dollar and a half after hours here. Um, Robinhood also out with earnings after hours. 
and uh, they're trading down just a hair, not a not a big amount there, but the, the big news out of Robinhood tonight was that they're laying off 23% of their staff. So, you know, maybe another sign there that, um, you know, the economy isn't quite as strong as a lot of people will want. Now, uh, that could also mean that that might slow down the Fed's interest rate hike uh, expectations there as well. So perhaps the market would interpret that positively. Uh, but it is going to be interesting to see how things shake out because earlier this year, we were in a situation where there just simply weren't enough workers for all the jobs that were out there. And now we're starting to see a lot more signs of actual laying off and people getting fired and that sort of a thing. So that might start correcting itself to a degree. And then uh, let's also take a look at Match Group. This is the company behind the online dating sites. And boy, oh boy, they're getting hit pretty hard after hours tonight. Um, they closed the normal session at $76. Looks like they're trading just a hair below $60 per share in the after hours session. So uh, it wasn't as consistent here tonight. Uh, you know, when we went through a bunch of the earnings names in one of my videos last week, I recall most of them were trading to the upside. Uh, that might have been the day when we had Microsoft and Alphabet and some of those higher. Uh, tonight it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. You've got PayPal on the upside, which uh, you know is good news because it's a mega cap company. Uh, but on the flip side of that, you got Airbnb and Match Group and a few of these others that seem to be uh, struggling a little bit more. Let's also come on over here to the charts and now start doing a bit of chart work using our uh, foregrid to get things started here. And uh, just as a heads up as to what the numbers were here today, the S&P 500 closed lower by 0.67%. The Dow Jones was the worst performer today, down 1.23%. We saw the NASDAQ composite down 0.16%. And then the Russell 2000 was down, but just barely, it was down 0.05%. So all four of them did close in the red to various degrees, but the best performer was the Russell 2000. The worst performer was the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the US dollar was rising today. And if that was the case, then that could explain some of the difference between those two. Remember the Dow Jones is chocked full of big international companies like McDonald's and you know, Coca-Cola and those types of companies that do business all across the globe and then send those profits back to be converted into US dollars here on our home shores. Whereas the Russell 2000 uh, is going to have a lot more just homegrown companies that do business solely within the United States. It doesn't have as big of a currency impact there uh, when the dollar bounces as it did here today. But as we take a look now at the postures of these four different uh, indices. Uh, notice that all four of the charts continue to have the dark green background color despite today's sell-off. And what that distinguishes is uh, a green line or the or the, the intermediate line. So they're, they're, they're one and the same. So the green line is the intermediate line. Uh, but it is remaining in the upper reversal zone on all four of these charts here, telling us that we continue to have a strongly bullish intermediate posture using the market forecast technical indicator. You'll also notice that all four of these charts continue to have green moving averages. And remember, what we use here is a 30-day moving average. So what a green moving average indicates is price is above a rising moving average, which is a bullish feature. And you'll notice that this is not anything um, new. We've been in these conditions for the last week, week and a half or so, and that's a positive sign. Remember, we had um, moments like this earlier in the year in 2022, but they unraveled rather quickly. Uh, this has been the greatest rebound attempt that we've seen so far in 2022 because it's shown a willingness to stay above those moving averages. In the past, they failed pretty much every time they got up to them. So uh, are we due for some sort of a pullback in the market? Probably. You know, we just had the best month for the stock market in the month of July, as I alluded to in my uh, Thursday video with you guys. Remember, we were going through all those statistics of previous months throughout history where it was up at least 7.5%. Well, little did I know, the market actually rallied furiously on Friday as well, uh, tacking on an additional percent or so. Uh, so it actually ended up being closer to a 9% uh, monthly return in the month of July, which is extraordinary. 
And so um, we all recognize that stocks don't go straight up. There has to be kind of a breathe in, breathe out type of sensation. And so we're probably due for a little bit of a, of a breathe out moment here. Uh, and whether it started today with you know, some of these uh, down candles uh, remains to be seen. But you know, if we could pull back to those rising moving averages and then show resiliency around there and find another bounce higher, that will actually kind of embolden the bulls a little bit more. And it might actually start scaring the bears a little bit as well. And that could be helpful in the grand scheme of things. So anyway, um, this has continued to be a more constructive uh, market environment that we found ourselves in here the last few weeks. Um, I should also point out that on three out of these four charts, we have what's known as a uh, bullish intermediate confirmation signal. And those signals appear when the green line is bullish. And remember, the green line can be bullish in a couple different ways. Either it is rising somewhere between 20 and 80, or it is simply in the upper reversal zone. So it ha you know, the green line has to basically have one of those two things going for it for this particular signal. And as I alluded to before, the green line on all four of these charts is in the upper reversal zone. So regardless of whether it's rising or falling, if it's above 80, we consider that to be bullish. So that is the first check mark. The second check mark is what is going on with the red momentum line. And you'll see in this case that with the S&P 500, the red momentum line is in the low reversal zone. That's the same thing for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and that's the same thing for the NASDAQ Composite down below. The only exception to that is the Russell 2000. Notice the red line is above the 20th percentile. It's at the 33rd percentile right now. Remember, you can read that directly in the labels for the current reading. And so this one would not qualify, but the other three do qualify as being what's known as bullish intermediate confirmation signals. And remember, that signal is effectively a buy the dip signal um, when the markets have a bullish intermediate trend in place, they're naturally going to pull back on occasion. And rather than chasing stocks and buying them at their exact tippy top highs, a lot of people like to look for some sort of a pullback to establish a position with the hopes that that intermediate trend will continue into the future. And this is just a temporary pullback. So that could very well be the case of what we're dealing with right now. Those three charts all do have um, two days in a row of selling. Now, the selling has not been extreme, uh, especially for like the NASDAQ. You can see both of those are red outlined candles the last two days, but they're basically just, you know, going slightly, slightly lower. You know, basically it's sideways to lower. The Dow Jones has given up a little bit more, so that's more of a legitimate, you know, kind of pullback that we've seen there. Uh, it hasn't been violent or anything like that, but it's been, you know, you could get away with saying that, hey, a 1% move off the top is somewhat of a buying a dip. Uh, it might not be a huge dip for, for some of you, depending upon what you're hoping to accomplish, but it is a legitimate pullback from the high as opposed to buying it back here on Friday at the high. Somebody who would have waited until today would have saved themselves, you know, one and a half percent or whatever it's been. So anyway, um, that one you'll notice does have a healthier pullback according to the blue near term line as well. While the blue near-term line is not technically part of the bullish intermediate confirmation signal, you'll hear David and I discuss how we can use it to try to determine which signals are considered better and which signals are considered worse. And when the blue line is somewhere between 20 and 50, it's a little bit more of a legitimate exhale. It's not just a you know, a small exhale. And so we view that as kind of a healthier si uh, signal there. The downside of that is we've also noticed that sometimes when the red line goes to an extreme reading, it can pull the rest of the market down. So you kind of have conflicting, um, you know, secondary considerations here where the blue line is where we want it, but the red line is a little bit too extreme of a sell off. And we usually use extreme levels as being five and below. So notice that the momentum line on the Dow Jones is at 0.91. So in other words, less than one. Uh, it can't go below zero. So that goes to show you how close it is to um, as low as it could possibly go. So um, you, you can maybe think of those perhaps as offsetting, like in, in the NFL offsetting 
setting penalties, right? One for one team, one for the other team. Well, here you've got a situation where the, the secondary considerations, you got one for the Bulls and one for the Bears. So uh, anyway, that seems to be a legitimate, uh, a little bit more of a legitimate, um, you know, buy the dip signal in that particular case. With these others, um, you're, you've got the issue with the blue line not being between 20 and 50. With the S&P 500, notice the blue line is at 50 spot 45, so it's not between those two. And the same thing goes for the NASDAQ composite. The blue line is at 65 right now, so it's not between 20 and 50. So there hasn't been enough of a exhale there to get excited about buying the dip in those two, whereas it's been a little bit more legitimate uh, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I just thought I would point that out as well because sometimes it's hard for you guys if you're not as involved in these charts as David and I might be to, to find those for yourself as well. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet briefly. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support this free presentation that is available to you. Uh, we just barely got up and over 100. In fact, I had to do some pleading with my class to get us up and over there. And as I was saying to them, you know, usually if I'm under 100 likes, I wonder to myself, well, is it because my trade example was so lousy? And I, I told them that couldn't have been the case in this case. In fact, I could make the case that the trade application I gave you in Thursday's video was literally my best trading idea I have ever given uh, this type of a video. And remember, David and I have been doing these market outlook videos here while we've been with Market Scholars for the last four plus years. But even prior to that, when we were working for TD Ameritrade, we did a very similar video called the Market Forecast video. And in both of those instances, which dates back nearly a decade, uh, I don't remember a single time where I placed a trade within the last 15 minutes of the session and then had it open up the very next day at max gain. Uh, and closing that down with one minute into the session. So I was in that trade for about 16 total trading minutes. Uh, and the, the other thing that I, I kind of had a chuckle at was some of you may have recalled that when I was delivering that uh, JD.com short selling idea to you on Thursday, uh, I was telling you that I might end up regretting that trade because that was the night that Amazon had reported their earnings and I, it just it didn't even cross my mind that uh, Amazon would have an impact on um, JD.com. And then when I saw Amazon flying higher, I'm like, oh no, uh, I bet my short selling idea on JD.com is probably going to rise. Uh, little did I know there was some sort of negative news about China-US relations in that overnight cycle and a lot of the Chinese stocks opened up uh, gapping lower the next day. So uh, that was kind of fun. You know, sometimes you get lucky, right? Sometimes you get you know, quite unlucky as well and it works the opposite way. So it's nice to see that it works out for you on occasion. So that was, that could have gone down as my, my um, you know, the, one of my better trades out there in terms of the um, small amount of time that we had to be in the trade in order to earn a max gain, especially on a swing trade like that. So anyway, thank you to those 101 of you that clicked like. Remember, that's the reason I'm doing a full length video for you right now. Had we had two less people that clicked like for me there, uh, I would already be done with this video and there would be no trade application example tonight. So keep up the great work there. I really do appreciate that. It helps us get the word out about our business to a much wider audience than we're able to on our own, which helps motivate us to do these free videos for everybody. So if you like our free content, then the only thing we ask in return is just clicking like for us on Twitter. And I think that's a pretty good trade off for you guys. Maybe you disagree. Uh, while we're over here, uh, I can also uh, point out that We've had some uh, recent posts that you might be interested in. Um, I posted the dividend growth investing increases from last month, July 2022, uh, yesterday. Uh, and so that is available. I also posted over the weekend the dividend stair step sector statistics. Uh, and both of those are available for free, right? There are some areas on our website that are uh, not behind the paywall. And those dividend growth investing increase uh, areas and the stair steps uh, statistics are uh, available for free for anybody, even if you're not a premium member of Market Scholars. Now, that doesn't mean you can attend my dividend growth investing classes or have access to the dividend stair step charts themselves, but at least you can kind of sink your teeth into 
um, the, the, the knowledge gained from those posts themselves if you're so inclined. So feel free to check those out. Uh, you can see what those kind of look like here where you're basically able to interpret which are the most attractive sectors here currently based upon the average high yield theory in this post. And then in, in this other post, you can see all those companies like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and Morgan Stanley and um, you know Stanley Black and Decker and those types of companies that increased their dividends last uh, month and by how much. Yeah, so if that's of interest to you, feel free to click into those popular recent posts there. Maybe you can also find that if you're looking for it on our website by hovering your mouse over the blog area and then coming down and clicking on dividend growth investing. That, that'll take you to that category where you can then check out those posts if you're interested. You'll also notice here that the trading rooms registration uh, is listed here. Uh, remember, David updates that every single month. And for our premium members, it allows you to basically register for all of our trading rooms in one fell swoop. So that way you don't have to do it every single class. It, it helps save you a lot of time. Um, I'm not sure what, what, what happened over the weekend because I haven't heard from David. I think he's on the road and, and traveling uh, into the Midwest, so I uh, don't want to disturb him too much there. But uh, I heard that he, he did not get a chance to send out the email like he typically does. So if you're one of our premium members and you're, you're waiting for his email, it might not come. Uh, however, you don't really need the email. The email is just simply a reminder that the, that the links have been updated. So um, you can simply click into this trading rooms registration area area here and just follow uh, the instructions on the tutorial video there if you've forgotten how to do that. But otherwise, the, um, the classes have obviously been already started here the last couple of days. So uh, we've been recording them. And if you've missed the live ones, you're welcome to, to go check them out. So for in instance, I, I did my dividend growth investing class today where we concentrated on the communications area, uh, which you can see is actually uh, best performing or not best performing, but I should say the, the most attractive according to dividend yield here at this moment in time. So we did focus on a head-to-head -head matchup within the communication sector here today. Uh, so feel free to check out that recording if you want. But I just wanted to point that out because if you are somebody that was waiting for the, the email and you're wondering why you haven't gotten it yet, um, you can always just go to our website and register for that even without David's reminder uh, email there along the way. And remember, if you can't find it in the popular recent posts like you see it right here, you can also find it by hovering your mouse over the Tools tab and coming down to Premium Resources, and then that Trading Rooms registration will be the first link that you see there, okay? All right, uh, let's go ahead and pop back on over here to the normal part of the platform and do some 12 grid analysis. So I'm going to come over here to chart 5A. And remember, the background colors of these 12 grids will signify whether we have a bullish or bearish intermediate posture according to the market forecast technical indicator. And so you can see on the chart in front of us, or the charts in front of us, that we have just two pink charts. And they happen to be in the two bottom corners. And they're uh, both uh, areas of the market that we've had pr a pretty keen interest in so far in 2022. And both of them were up quite nicely today, even though they have faltered in the last couple of weeks. So let's talk it through, starting with the chart in the lower right hand corner, because this is, from my perspective, probably the most important move I saw in the markets today. Now, obviously, some of you may disagree with that. You may have other things you're looking at. But to me, this was a biggie uh, because this, was the U this is the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. And as I've kind of stated to you guys uh, a number of times this year, it has a lot of control over our market right now. And part of the reason that we've had such a furious rally in stocks is because tech stocks have once again started leading the way. Tech stocks started leading the way by no surprise when the 10-year treasury yield started to roll over. And that happened here kind of in the mid to late June time period. As you can see, we topped out and then have been kind of rolling over here over the last um, you know month and a half or thereabouts. You can see here that we're still down 8.5% on the 10-year treasury yield over the last three months of this chart. But you can also see how important today's candle was. In fact, let me right click on the chart and go to maximize cell so that way you guys can see this a little bit better. 
take a look at this candle today. That was that was a monstrous candle. Um, we have had a pretty ugly sell-off in treasury yields for the last month and a half, as I mentioned a moment ago, and notice where it kind of culminated with a couple of oversold cluster signals. Those little green dots that you showed or that you see showing up on the charts right here signify those oversold cluster signals, and that occurs when you get the, the blue the red and the green lines on the market forecast technical indicator in the lower reversal zone, so in other words, below the 20th percentile on the same day. And you had back-to-back -back days last, or actually it was Friday and then yesterday, which was Monday, um, where you saw that condition exist. And when you start seeing those types of things, the expectation, or at least one thought in the back of your mind should be, hey, things have gotten a little bit extreme in one direction, so don't be surprised if there is a big move against that particular um, trend. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it'll be trend changing, it just basically means that the selling had become overdone in yields, and we are probably due for some sort of a snapback. It does not have to be trend changing, but oftentimes what happens is we get a snapback at a minimum up here towards that moving average. And so when treasury yields have been falling for the last month and a half, we've actually had a pretty substantial stock market rally led by the technology stocks. Technology stocks are uh, long duration assets that benefit when treasury yields roll over. So if we're about to encounter the opposite of that, perhaps that also means that technology stocks could start stumbling a little bit once again, and that could also mean um, that the, the market in general could struggle a little bit in that environment. Because remember, technology stocks are the most important stocks here in the United States. Stocks like Apple and Microsoft, as just a couple of examples, are the two largest publicly traded companies here in the United States, and they both belong to the technology sector. And so um, we have to be on the lookout for the possibility of the US Treasury yield kind of starting to cause a little bit of indigestion within the stock market once again. We'll see. Uh, what I can tell you is that today was what we would refer to as a bullish engulfing candle for the 10-year Treasury yield. In fact, this candle today not only engulfed yesterday's candle, but it also engulfed Friday's candle, came pretty close to engulfing Thursday's candle as well. So that was a huge, huge um, candle there. In fact, one of the things I heard on business television first thing this morning before the market opened was that the 10-year treasury yield was down there close to like 2.59%. Uh, you can see that we closed at 2.74%. Uh, and that might not sound like a lot to some of you who are newer to looking at yields, but that is a huge move. Uh, so we went from being way down low, closer to 2.5%, to being all the way up at 2. 75% in just one single trading session. So keep your eye on that possibility. If this continues, and let's say for the next week or two, we see treasury yields rising towards this moving average, it's entirely possible that the stock market could struggle in that environment if you know the, the, the past um, you know, correlations types of, of ideas do hold. Um, over here on the left hand side is our other chart that's in the pink and that is the US dollar. That also has important implications for the stock market and other types of financial markets that are out there. Now, unlike the 10-year uh, Treasury yield, which had previously been in an uptrend for much of 2022 and then more recently um, has fallen out of that uptrend, because I think we could look at this chart off to the right hand side here and say that's a broken trend there. I'm not sure I'd be as willing to say the same thing about the US dollar. It doesn't mean we can't get there, but I'm just here to say that in my eyes, the US dollar actually has a more substantial uptrend than what we saw more recently out of the US Treasury yield. So today was an important day for it as well. Let me right click there and you'll notice that we do have a nice snapback rally and we put ourselves right back at that 30 day moving average here today. So yesterday it did uh, eclipse that moving average to the downside, but we're back kind of spot on it right now. And so that's gonna be an important area to see if it can bounce from that level or not. Because you could still get away with saying that this is a chart that has higher highs and higher lows. 
um, and therefore could very well be considered an uptrend. In fact, the moving average is still rising, right? Uh, so from that very simple perspective, you could still say this is an uptrending security. But according to the market forecast technical indicator, this green line is suggesting that we now have a bearish posture on the US dollar. So we kind of have conflicting signals there. On the one hand, you could get away with saying it's an uptrend. On the other hand, you could get away with saying that you have a bearish posture on it. So um, we'll just have to see how this kind of plays itself out. And remember, you don't need to play in every game. Uh, you can sit this one out if it's too hard. If you're saying, hey, I'm getting too many conflicting signals, uh, it's not necessary for you to be involved in every trade. Uh, you can sit quietly from the sidelines and watch it play out and then you know, enter whatever uh, trade in the future with a little bit more confidence. But this one is at kind of a make or break point right here where that 30-day moving average could very well act as uh, a support area for it. Uh, but um, you know, uh, if it starts failing a little bit more, it's going to call that into question. Another thing I'd point out about the U.S. dollar is that where it bottomed out yesterday, you'll notice is right in alignment with the prior highs from over here on June 14th. So remember that concept of old resistance potentially becoming new support. So technicians do have that going in their favor for the US dollar right now as well. And remember, the US dollar is not something that we trade a whole lot probably as individual investors, but it does have important implications across a lot of the markets we do trade. Remember, the US dollar um, is going to have an impact on commodities and it's gonna have an impact on foreign assets. And you can see that at least for gold, the gold market was down here today. Uh, and you can also see for foreign assets, we had quite the sell-off there, at least with EFA, it actually underperformed the US markets. EFA, from the developed foreign stock perspective, was down 1.6% today in the face of a strong US dollar. So it's gonna be really interesting because you can almost see, it's like a, a, a Rorschach test here between gold and the US dollar. Gold had made an important move back up to its own moving average at the same time the US dollar went down to its moving average. If that is now reversing and the US dollar starts going up, then gold could easily make this move that it made in the last couple of weeks fail and we might be right back into that downtrend. So let's keep our eye on that possibility as well. The moving average on gold continues to be the downside. It was down about 0.59% today. Oil did manage to buck the trend. Uh, oil was up today. However, that chart on oil does not look particularly enticing here. Remember, for the first part of 2022, that this was the go-to trade. Oil, oil, oil. Uh, it was one of the only areas working in the market. But here in the last month and a half to two months, there's been a little bit of a temperature change in that department. A lot of the oil companies are coming out with stellar earnings still, and that makes sense. Uh, they've been kind of in desperate times in years before 2022 when they were reporting losses. So it's kind of like feast or famine in that particular industry. When oil prices are finally high like they are here this year, uh, they're going to be in feast mode. But uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Remember, oil in a lot of ways is a way to take the temperature of the economy. And earlier this year, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, when you know we had desperation around hiring enough employees and things like that, the, the economy was red hot. That's what's causing this inflation, right? Um, and, and so oil was basically a way for you to look at the gauge of how strong the economy was. Uh, fast forward to where we're at right now, where the Fed has now started its interest rate rising campaign or raising campaign, it's starting to try to stamp out inflation. We're starting to see companies like Robinhood and others laying off their workforce. The economy is weakening. And in response to that, oil is starting to suffer a little bit there as well. So uh, we'll see where that takes us, but it's no longer a layup the way it was earlier in 2022 when you enter into the oil market. In terms of other uh, important movements here today, you know, uh, obviously with such a huge move higher in interest rates, bonds got hit today. So the te the, the, the long-term uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, were down by over 2% today. That's a pretty aggressive candle there on TLT. Uh, foreign bonds were also down here today, and then high yield bonds were also down. But you'll notice that those are kind of counter trend types of moves. They all retain their strongly bullish postures, even though they had a, a pretty significant one day pullback here today. So we'll see if that changes in the weeks to come, but right now they're still in okay shape. 
Um, one that does catch my eye that we don't talk as much about was uh, preferred stocks. You did see quite an impressive move higher on PFF here today, where you're basically knocking on the door of breakout territory. In fact, I think you got just a hair up and over the high price of uh, May 27th. I don't know anything specifically that's moving preferred stocks right now. Uh, I didn't catch it at least if there was anything in the news, but uh, just simply you know, keep an eye on that from a technical analysis perspective. That's a good sign that you were breaking out and over those areas. And it's a little bit peculiar that you're seeing it happen um, on a day like today as well, because a lot of times preferred stocks kind of act like bonds and you'll notice they've had a big move here in the last month and a half, just like bonds have had a big move off of the bottom. But today when bonds were down across the board and preferred stocks continue to go up, maybe that's something like a little bit of a poker tell there where there's, there's, there's an interest in these types of securities here all of a sudden, who knows where that leads us. So let's keep our eye on that theme there as well. All right, let's go ahead and now pop on over here to our sector analysis with chart 5C. And as you can see, we've got green across the board. So we enjoy seeing that, of course, if, as long as we're long stocks, because it basically means, you know, no matter what sector you're in, you've seen at least at a bare minimum some uh, stabilization. And in other cases, you've seen outright strength. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned here a moment ago, the area that's been kind of leading us out of the hole uh, out of the last month and a half has been technology. And you can see that this has actually been some pretty substantial price action here in the top upper right when you're looking at where we were just in the middle of July to where we're at right now. However, with interest rates surging today, we did see that technology was down 0.71%, uh, one of the bigger movers to the downside in the grand scheme of things. There's some other charts on the board that you really haven't seen as much movement out of. Communications is one of those, and that might be more of like kind of a Snapchat type of a story there. Uh, you're also finding that healthcare is kind of stalled out a little bit down below here. We talked about that a little bit um, in my uh, top-down trend trading class here yesterday. Uh, some of those big pharma names like Merck and Bristol Myers and others that were really working nicely earlier this year have, have cooled off pretty considerably here more recently. Uh, whereas some of the more biotech oriented names are holding up still reasonably well uh, with you know catching the risk on trade. Uh, it's kind of being offset by the big bulky major pharmaceuticals kind of um, you know with a little bit of downside price action here. So you know those areas aren't you know making as big of a move as like what you're seeing out of technology and discretionary and even industrials. I didn't mention this specifically, but back over here on our website, if you come over here to our tools area and pull up actually the sector selector, uh, if you're a premium member, you would see here that um, industrials made its way into the top four of the rankings. And this is the first time in over three months that has been the case. They've been flirting with the top four quite a few times where they got up to number five several times in the last three months, but this was the first time they cracked into the top four. So industrials have made quite an interesting move here recently. And a lot of those alternative energy names have kind of had an impact there as well. Um, you know, stocks like PWR come to mind that are industrials companies that benefit when there is spending on alternative energy. So anyway, keep your eye on that sector. It's kind of been a, a sneaky one that not a whole lot of people have been talking about, but there has been some legitimate strength coming into the industrials lately. Um, in terms of uh, who the uh, best performers were today versus who the worst performers were today, all of these sectors were down today, but it was communications that was down the least amount. Remember, they didn't go up much, so they didn't perhaps have as many profits to give back on a day like today. So uh, they were only down 0.16% today. In terms of who the worst was here today, uh, let's see, it would have been, was it industrials? Actually, it was real estate. Real estate was down 1.32% today. And that somewhat makes sense there as well. Remember, uh, REITs are highly interest rate sensitive because they're bond-like proxies. And so 
um, when you uh, you know compare um, you know the, the the dividend yields out there, the REITs usually have the highest dividend yields compared to the other sectors that are out there. So sometimes there's that trade-off effect that takes place. And on a day like this, where the where the interest rate environment went up significantly, that generally hurts REITs and utilities. Utilities seem to hold in there a little bit better today than expected, but REITs kind of perform their typical role on a day like that where they were down. Uh, 1.32%. All right, let's go ahead and now get into our trade application example. And I mentioned this company earlier. And I'll bring it up here once again. And the ticker symbol is AMZN. Most of you are aware this is Amazon.com, of course, one of the largest publicly traded companies uh, on planet Earth and one of the most important retailers out there these days as well. And um, Amazon, as uh, I alluded to earlier, uh, had a huge move higher on its earnings late last week. That was the day I was fearful that it would uh, impact my JD.com trade, which I was thankful it actually did not end up impacting it all that much. But nonetheless, you had uh, you had a little bit of upside action there in Amazon, which you hadn't seen for a while. It was a stock that was somewhat struggling. And so, um, you know, what kind of caught my eye about it here today was that it seems in my eye to be stalling out a bit right here. Uh, because when I look at these three candles for the last three trading days, notice that Amazon has what we would refer to as long upper shadows there, or some of you might call those wicks on your candle. But what that basically represents is a situation where the bulls had some energy on an intraday basis and tried to push the stock up but the bears weren't having it and they kept on pushing it back lower by the end of the day. And that's usually not the healthiest of signs. You typically want um, strength to occur when the stocks are trading at their highs at the end of the session or at least near them. So this is giving you the impression that it's not necessarily going to be a runaway success the way that a lot of people had hoped when they had this huge gap up after their earnings. It seems like they've kind of pushed into the maximum amount of you know, upside potential here in the short term. I could be wrong about that, of course, but that's what the impression of the candles is, is giving to me at this moment in time. Now, in addition to that kind of stalling out factor with the long upper, uh, upper shadows there, I also thought it was interesting to point out that we have a little bit of a bearish near-term divergence taking place here as well, where you had a high on the near-term line back here on uh, July 21st, you had a follow-up high on the near-term line on, on July 29th. But this high was slightly lower than this high. On that day, uh, the near-term line was at 95. On this day, the near-term line was at 90, so lower by five points. Now, the two candles associated with those two levels of the indicator are this candle right here, and then this candle right here. And you can see obviously the price went up from here up to here at a time when the underlying indicator actually showed a little bit of deterioration. So that has a minor impact on why I was interested in a bearish trade here on Amazon today as well. And then one other thing I wanted to point out is this chart here that we're looking at currently is a three month chart. But if we were to extend this back a bit further in time, let's go back, let's just see what a one year uh, chart would look like in this case. Yeah, I think this will help me make my point, which is, as you can see here, Amazon with this big gap up after their earnings has really just put it back on the underside of this prior horizontal support area. So if I were to get my drawn items out here, um, I can help you see that maybe a little bit better. And let's just draw it something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you'll get the gist of what I'm, I'm trying to present here, which is you had three different kind of support levels here and touch points where Amazon appeared to want to bounce from, right? You had touch point one, you had touch point two, you had touch point three, and that third one came with an oversold cluster signal on the, on the daily candle chart, and you had one day of upside immediately thereafter, but then it failed in a big way, and that one actually happened on the prior quarterly earnings announcement. So from that point going forward, we have now spent all of that time below that blue line. 
In the three months prior to that point, that blue line had represented a strong support area where all the trading action was above it. So now we're testing that level again and that idea that old support can become new resistance could very well be a useful technique to consider for a bearish trade here as well because there will be some people that say, okay, I've had enough. You know, you might have been somebody who uh, decided to take a stab at Amazon right here. You'd had to have been pretty brave knowing that earnings were coming up, you know, within a couple of days. But who knows? Some some folks might have taken a stab on the long side of Amazon right here at around, you know, $137 or something like that because they had noticed the last two times that it bounced from that level. So, you know, third time's a charm. Maybe they get it. Well, they found out within 48 hours that they made a bad decision with that. And then they were underwater on their trade all the way until basically yesterday when it once again got up there to about 137 or 138 dollars and some of them might have started selling their stake once they got back to break even right and so that's the concept whether that is actual reality or not is anybody's guess but in some ways technical analysis is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So even if people aren't doing that, if they think other people are doing that, then everybody's kind of rushing for the exits at the same time. So that might be another reason why you look at this and say, yeah, this could be an interesting bearish setup here. You can also see obviously Amazon is underperforming the S&P 500's dotted line here over the last year of this particular chart. So you could get away with saying it's an underperformer still at this point, despite the big bounce back rally that the uh, stock had after their earnings announcement. So what I chose to do in today's case was what's known as a bear call spread. It's a, it's a selling strategy where I sell one call and I buy another and I collect a credit up front for doing it. And I believe it was the September 147 strike that I sold and the 148 strike that I bought. Remember, if you're a premium member, you can always go and check all the trade details on our Telegram alert because remember, we do these trades before the market is closed, just like I did with the JD.com uh, situation last week. I'm not making that up after the fact. You can actually see uh, the, the timestamps and, and the, you know, the, uh, the the the, uh, the strikes if there were any involved and uh, the fill prices and all that good stuff. So that's one of the key benefits of being a premium member of Market Scholars is you get alerted to what David and I are trading before everybody else who's watching the free video. Uh, and in most cases, that doesn't really matter because what's the difference of one day? But uh, obviously in Thursday's case, it was a huge difference because if you were someone who only watched the free videos, you likely wouldn't have been able to do the short selling idea on JD.com until the next day unless uh, you happen to do it in the after hours session immediately after I posted the video, which is probably not gonna happen for most of you. So that would have been a prime example of why there's so much value in the, um, the premium service that we offer here to get information in advance because a handful of you probably took that trade with 15 minutes to go uh, on Thursday uh, and then immediately hit max gain Friday morning whereas everybody else who's just watching the free video that night wouldn't have been able to get into that trade because by the next morning the gap down had already taken place. So uh, again, that doesn't happen a lot but I like to point it out when it does happen because it does remind us of why you as a premium member have a distinct informational advantage over everybody else that simply watches the videos for free and is not a premium member of ours. So uh, take advantage of that Telegram app uh, if you are one of our premium members. But I did the 147, 148 in this particular case. I think I collected a credit of, I think it was 26 cents. So that does give us more than a 30% return on risk for that bear call spread. And 147, 148 would put our break even somewhere up in this general vicinity up here. So basically for those of you that are newer uh, to you know options trading and things like that, what I'm basically saying with that type of a trade is I want Amazon to stay below this level that I'm kind of circling with my mouse between now and the middle of September. So if it starts sputtering right here and falling back and starting to fill in this gap here, then I will be happy about that. On the other hand, if it starts surging higher, then uh, I won't be happy about that because I'll probably end up losing money on the trade. But the good news about selling a bear call spread 
is I have defined risk in the trade. So if it were to go above 148, remember the whole point of me buying the 148 call is to protect myself to the upside. So uh, I would end up losing money on the trade, but I will not lose additional money beyond 148 because I have the long call embedded in that, uh, that, that spread trade there. So what I want is for it to stay below 147 uh, between now and expiration in the middle of September. Uh, but if it doesn't, then I have that built-in hedge there to help me along with the trade as well. Okay, so that's what I had for you. Bearish trade on Amazon. Uh, based upon the you know the bearish near-term divergence, uh, the, the the bearish line that we're seeing on the um, on the on the near-term line right now, um, also on the concept of old support becoming new resistance and the underperformance versus the S and P 500. If you got value out of that conversation and you want us to continue to provide free trade application examples like JD.com and Amazon.com and others, then I ask one simple request out of you, and it doesn't even cost you any money. All it does is cost you five seconds of your time, and that is to simply go over and click like for me there on Twitter. And remember, there's four different ways you can do that. You can either go directly to my Twitter feed where I'll have the most recent Market Outlook video pinned to the top of my timeline, or you can uh, click like there directly on our website while you're watching the video there. If you watch the video directly on YouTube, you can go into our description area and you'll find the Twitter link in question in that area. And then last but not least, those of you that are on our email distribution list will also find the tweet by clicking on the Twitter icon within the emails themselves. So there's four different ways you could get there to help uh, us get up and over 100 likes. Uh, and if that's the case, I'll be happy to do a full length video for you again on Thursday. If we're under 100 likes, then I'll just do a 15 minute only on the uh, indices with no trade application example. So I'll let you guys decide if you like the shorter ones or if you like these longer ones that include the trade application example. So with that, I wanna wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.